the Europe's version of the presentation. Uh, we use the one that we have on the website. Right? Yeah, it was on that one. So you're yeah. so they are yeah. on the website. Yeah, right? yeah. And then should be okay. The yeah. If you come on right now, Can people over Zoom hear us? Yes, Mohammed, we can hear you. Okay, I guess uh, we are ready. So Is we... uh, Julian around? Yes. <laughs> Julian, please come. Um... Uh, the live streaming is already on, so whenever the student is ready, Julian can introduce the student and we can go ahead. Yeah, maybe you can start. So um, our next presenter is uh, Jacob. So he's in the sixth semester of uh, computer science uh, bachelor at ETH. And he's uh, mostly, uh, his main interest are uh, robotics, uh, system programming, and embedded systems. And today he's going to present the Green Filter uh, paper. OK, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Today we'll talk about Green Filter, the fast location filtering with DNA mapping using processing and memory technologies. This paper was published in 2018 in the BBC Genomics. Many crucial applications of DNA sequencing, such as preventative and personalized medicine could benefit greatly from faster and high throughput DNA sequencing. But the problem here is that DNA sequencing is mainly bottlenecked by read mapping, an approximative split matching problem. The paper has a key idea here, and the idea is to improve the performance of read mapping by avoiding redundant sequence alignment using new processing and memory technologies. Paper proposes Green Filter, a novel C location filter using 3D stacked memory and processing memory technologies to speed up and improve filtering. Compared to the state of the art read mapper and fast, with fast hash, it's on average twice as fast and has a six times lower source negative rate. This is the outline for today. First, I will talk about, about background, then about the paper, Green Filter, and the relation. Afterwards, I come to the conclusion and my personal opinion about the paper, and finally, a short discussion. So, now to the background. Probably all of you know about DNA. Can you please raise your hands if you feel like you know the basics of DNA? So, most of you. Great. And have you heard of DNA sequencing? Do you know how it works? Just roughly. Also, raise your hand, please, if you feel like you know it. I almost read. So DNA, as you know, is a sequence of the basis A, C, D, and T. And the human genome is very long. It consists of 3.2 billion base pairs. And imagine you have a very thin and long molecule. If you try to read it, you'll probably break apart into many short sequences. Just like an old book, which falls apart if you uh, try to read it. And current machines will break the genome into these so-called reads, and they are on or 120,000 base pairs long. Now to sequencing. Every, everything starts with the genomic sample here, for example, a blood drop or other biological tissue. After some pre-processing, this is then 
put into a sequencing machine, which produces many reads. Now, the problem is we don't know where these reads come from from China. Luckily, there exists a reference China, which was computed beforehand. And then you can try to look where they match on the reference China. If you know where they're coming from, we can determine the genomic variance. This is, for example, important if you know a person has the gene type A, for example, he might be susceptible for heart conditions. Or also in person has medicine, if you know his genes, we might know which type of effects he might suffer from and choose different medications instead. The most important step for this paper is the read mapping step. The read mappers uh, looked at in this paper for the following way. First, there is an indexing step. In the indexing step, the reference genome is split into many short sequences called k-mers, and then they are used to build a hash table relating these k-mers to locations where they appear in the reference genome. This is the pre-computation step, and it's done beforehand once for the whole group reference genome. When we then want to know if this read map somewhere onto the reference genome. We also extract some k-mers called seeds here and use them in combination with this pre-computed hash table to get a list of many seed locations. So we know the read might be here, here, or here. Thank you. And then we have to check them. This is done a second step, the sequence alignment step. Here we use a dynamic, pro dynamic program algorithm similar to the shortest edit distance to figure out how similar it is to the reference genome. The problem with this is this alignment step is very expensive. And we observe that most of these seed locations don't even match. So we do many, many calculations which are unnecessary. The idea is to discard these locations as early as possible without doing the sequence alignment step. That's why there's only a pre-alignment filter before the sequence alignment. The job of this filter is to look at these many seed locations and remove them if they're obviously bad. Green filter is such a pre-alignment filters. It's not the first, there are others like gatekeeper or shifting hammer distance, but green filter is a bit special. It's special because it uses really stacked memory. Here we see an image of an HDM module, and it consists of multiple layers of DRAM stacked on top of each other. They are connected using CSVs through silicon gears. They offer very fine pitch, so they have a high internal bandwidth between these layers. Below all of these DRAM layers is a logic die. This logic die is there to control all the DRAM layers above, and also we can put some customized logic in there and this enables processing in memory. One might argue that it's processing near memory because it's only here, not in the memory itself, but the paper always calls it processing in memory, so I'll stick to that. Another benefit is that the silicon interposer also offers a higher density of the interconnection as normal PCP interconnects, also a higher bandwidth. PCP interconnects are, for example, used if you have the DRAM um, on, on dim sticks far away from the processor. The typical size of these modules is 16 gigabytes. This was in 2018. Today, they're probably 24 gigabytes. This is the logical layout of this 3D stack memory. And each of these DRAM layers consists of multiple DRAM banks with their own row buffers and memory arrays. They are connected from top to bottom using these TSVs. And one of such a stack here with the logic layer and the DRAM layer above is called a vault. And in one of these vaults, only one row buffer can be copied down at a time. This allows very high parallelizable memory access because each of these vaults can copy its own row buffer down and compute down here or send it over interconnect. Frame filter can utilize all of these characteristics. That's the background. Now would be a great time to ask questions about the background so you understand the next part. Was everything clear? Great. 
Great, so I will continue. I will explain Grim filter in these three steps. First, the pre-computation, then the filtering, and finally, how it's mapped to Swedish text mining. The pre-computation. Here you have the reference here, this is given, and now we split it into bins. For each of these bins, we compute a bit vector. And in this bit vector here, each bit indicates the presence of a token in the bin. For example, here are listed all the tokens of length n. A token is just a sort short sequence of four letters. And you see here, a has a a a a as a zero, and a a a is not present in bin one. But on the hand, c c c a is present as a one here, and you can see it. These bit vectors have the length for the power of n, where n is the length of the tokens. So n should be smaller, and then the consumption will explode. How does this help us? Now suppose this is the reference genome, and we have two seed locations here and here for the read g, t, c, c, t, t. Now we can use these bits. We compare the seed locations that the read with all possible bins. So uh, first we compare this read with the bit vector of bin two. And here we have like one in CCTT. There's also CCTT here. So it's somehow similar. I will explain it later and we'll pass. And here for bin four, we look at bit vector four. There's a zero here, but it's present there. So it won't, it's not similar and it won't, uh, Pass the filter and we'll get discarded. Important here is that the read must be complete inside the bin. That is because the comparison only makes sense if the bit vector contains all information of the read. This also means that the bins must overlap by read size. So we always find the bin which fits over the read. Now to the filtering. Grim filter tries here to compare a read against the bit vector of one of the possible bins. It starts by looking at all the tokens in the read. First at the first token, takes this token, looks up the corresponding bit in the bit vector and adds it to a sum. Then it moves to the next token, looks it up in the bit vector, there's a one, so the sum is incremented. Then the third token, one again, increment. Fourth token is a zero, so it won't be incremented. This is repeated for all of the tokens in the read. This then results in the sum C. Important to note here is if a token appears multiple times in this read, it will get the sum C will get incremented multiple times, not only once. This sum C then is compared against the threshold value. If it's larger, we keep the seed location and pass it on to the sequence alignment. And if it's lower, we discard it. This result here is stored in a seed location to the bit mask for later use. The discarding doesn't really happen at this step right now. Now it gets a bit confusing because in the paper, they labeled this one in this order. So discarding is a positive result and keeping is a negative result. So what happens if I have a false negative? So a seed location which was kept and passed onward to the sequence alignment step and fails there. This isn't really a problem. It just means our filter isn't that good. So false negative rate should be as low as possible. What happens if a false positive? So a seed location which was discarded but would have passed the sequence alignment. This is very bad because we just threw away information. The seed location would have been a match and we threw it away too early. So now this poses the question, how do we choose this threshold such that we achieve the zero false positive rate? Alignment usually has an error tolerance E, approximately 5%. So it, uh, when we try to map a read to the reference genome, it allows for some errors. And interestingly here, more errors result in a lower sum C. The key idea here is to 
to overestimate the number of errors in a read just passing alignment. This allows us to achieve this read passing alignment must have less errors than this overestimation and therefore will have a sum C greater than threshold and will pass, be passed onwards. Maybe it's a bit more clear in this equation. Here, this is the number of tokens in a read. And over there is maximum numbers of <coughs> maximum number of errors in a read allowable. If it has more than one pass sequence alignment. And this times n here is necessary because one error in the read can affect up to n tokens simultaneously. Now to uh, step, take a step back and look at the big picture again, how it's integrated into read mapping. It starts with the read. This is then first processed by the first step of the read mapper, the indexing and seeding step. This step produces many seed locations. These are then together with the read passed to the green filter, filter bit mask generator. This is the part where this summation takes place and the threshold check. This results then in a distinct location fit the bit mask. So each bin here has a bit, and the bit indicates whether the threshold check was passed or not. This is then sent to the green field to see the location checker. This is the part responsible for filtering. It's located between the indexing step and the sequence alignment step. For example, the first read here hits a one, so it's passed onward. Second one, also one, also passed onward. And the third one here, it's a zero, so it gets discarded. Finally, this sequence alignment step produces then the correct output matrix. Now, it might be a bit weird that the green filter is split into these two parts here, but it has reason because this part here is done using processing and memory technologies. Do you have any questions until now? Yeah? So, why is it Why is it Oh, why it's for? Yeah, it's just an example. It's like a design parameter in the paper, and I explore it later. I won't talk about this, but in the discussion, it's, it's just a short number. Uh, it must be small, and there are some trade offs when it gets large or when it gets too small. And later, I believe they chose five. For it. Any more questions? Now to map into the three D stacked memory. Green filter is designed to fit three D stacked memory well. It does this by only using simple operations like increment and comparison. Additionally, all the bins can be checked in parallel because they are independent. Now remember this logic layout of the three D stacked memory again. We now have to put our pre-computed data, all these bit vectors, somewhere in here. We do it column wise. This is done such that we can, when we read one row buffer, we access all bits of many bins for the same token. So we can, early in the step, we access like the bit for a certain token and then add a bit. Now we can do this for many bit vectors in parallel because they are all loaded like one row at a time. In the logic layer, we have some specialized logic module for each bin. Here we have everything we need for this incrementing, incrementing and threshold check. In total, we can copy 4096 bits at the same time in this whole memory to the bottom. So we have 4096 incremental lookup tables, seven bit counters here for the uh, for storing the sum and then comparison comparators for the final output value. Seven bits here because you only look at very short reads in this paper and seven bits is enough to store. Luckily, Grimfilter, this metadata computed by Grimfilter only uses 3.8 gigabytes, which is well below the 16 gigabytes offered by this computer. Now to the evaluation. As I said, there are a few design parameters we have to fix. For example, the token size of five is chosen here, and the bin count of 450 times two to the power of 60. This is well explained in the paper, and they did some experiments, and all the graphs are there, but I won't go into detail here. 
I have some backups now, so if you're interested. Springfield is then simulated using in house 3D stack DRAM simulator or Dremulator and evaluated on 10 real world data sets. They're from the 1000 Genomes project. And as I said, importantly, all the reads are of length 100. They are related to two key metrics execution time and false negative rate. They are then compared against the state of the art read map and Mr. Fast with Fast Hash to the results. The first uh, execution time is on average twice as fast as MR fast, as seen here. And in all of the data sets, it's faster. Some is it's even quite a bit faster, but it's faster on all of them. And the false negative rate is much lower. That means the filter works better on all of them. On, the, on average, it has a six times lower false negative rate. So now the conclusion. There are many problems which, such as uh, preventative and personalized medicine, which would benefit from faster DNA sequencing, and DNA sequencing is bottlenecked by read mapping. This paper proposes to improve the performance of read mapping by avoiding redundant alignment using pre-alignment filter, especially using processing in memory technologies. It proposes screen filter, a novel seed location filter utilizing 3D stacked memory and processing memory technologies to speed up and improve filtering. This results in a filter which is twice as fast and has a six times lower false negative rate than first. Now to the strength. I believe the main strength of this paper is that it it's the first to use three stack memory for pre aligned filters, so it explores truly novel design space. Additionally, I, in my opinion, it's well, this, uh, well suited for processing memory. It's designed to use the characteristics very well. And it's orthogonal to other attempts of improving read mappers. That means other papers trying to improve read mappers, for example, by improving the sequence alignment step can be combined with this one, and then we have even better results. The design parameter space is explored, and decisions are well explained. And finally, the code is open source, which is always nice. Now to the weaknesses. Print filter is only tested with very short reads. This means it's limited to Illumina machines, which produce, for example, reads of the length 100 to 300 base pairs. So these are even longer than the ones which was tested, but it's close enough. Park bio machines, for example, produce reads in the length of 50,000 base pairs to 20,000 base pairs, so much longer. And Oxford nanocore technologies claim that they have machines which can produce up to 30 million base pairs on these. And some information in the paper is never mentioned. For example, the bin size. It's only the only bin count is mentioned, and not exactly how they overlap. So it's a bit unclear how large these bins actually are. And it could be interesting to know this. Also the exact memory layout, for example, how large these row buffers are and how many volts there are is not really mentioned. And the data used for the graphs is said not publicly available. So if you want to know the exact values, you have to take screenshots and count pixels, which is is quite annoying. And there's some uh, minor mistakes in the paper. For example, this one here, there's a sentence as shown in figure 5D, a token of size n in a bin overlaps with n minus one of tokens. And this is the figure for the sentence. And here we see an error overlapping with n of the tokens. And the uh, described scenario here is we have a token here, marked in blue, and then overlaps with n minus one on this side, but also with n minus one on the other side. Small mistake here. But on the other hand, it was very well written and nice to read. Not a discussion. Are there questions right now? Here, I tried to estimate the memory usage when we increase the read length. This is guesstimation on my part. There could be mistakes in here. Now, look, let's look at this equation. The memory usage 
is equal to the bin count times the bit vector size. Now we try to keep everything constant and only increase the read length and look what happens to this equation. So the bin count is constant, but the bin length increases with read length. This happens because the bins must overlap by read size. If you have the same number of bins and they have to overlap by more, then they get long. Now look, let's look at the effects of this fact here. If you have a bin of size 100, it has 97 tokens. And here is a bit vector of size 256 bits. And there are many more bits than tokens in here. So there will probably be many zeros and only a few ones. But on the other hand, if you have a bin of size 1000, it has many more tokens and the bit vector didn't increase in size. That means that, is, that there are probably mostly ones in here. This is bad because only zero help us filter out bad C locations. This means that the ability to filter decreases with increasing bin size. To combat this, we could increase the token size to keep the expected bit vector of occupancy constant. So we try to keep the same number of ones compared to the numbers of zeros in there. And that tries to estimate this using a <coughs> script which generates random bins and then computes the bit vectors and counts how many ones there are. And in the configuration used in the paper, they have an occupancy of 3.3% and the main usage is at 3.8 gigabytes. If we now increase the read length, we also increase like the occupancy and decrease the filtering strength. And to combat this, I had to increase the token length to six, which to kind of match these as close as possible. And this results in a memory usage of 15.1 gigabytes. So already quite close to the maximum of 16 gigabytes allowed for the memory. And now with 5,000, it already increases to 16 gigabytes and with 10,241, so it really explodes. Do you have any idea how we could deal with long tweets? So my idea is quite simple. You don't really have to think too far. We could just split them. Does this solve the problem? With the memory consumption, can you please raise your hands if you think the problem is solved with memory consumption? Yeah, and raise your hands if you think it's not solved. Very interesting. I believe it, it's solved because we now have many more shorter reads, so it's just like having short reads from the beginning. But there's a big problem with this. Do we have an idea? What's the problem with this approach? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we lose information because we have the read and then we split it. We don't know in short data where we lose some information. For example, this paper here discusses some uh, complex isoforms can only be detected when using um, DNA sequencing machines which produce long reads, for example, of the non properties. Another idea is just to accept the trade offs. One trade-off I already mentioned, for example, the higher memory consumption. Either we accept it and just throw more memory at the problem, or we increase the false negative rate to uh, reduce the memory consumption. Do you have some ideas uh, what are other problems if we increase the long read except of memory consumption? Maybe think about the, the hardware and the logic there. What happens to this? Is it unaffected by the read size or does something interesting happen there? Yeah, for example, the logic die space consumption is increased because the, the campus must be larger. We now have a very long read and the sum C will get much larger. Therefore, we need larger counters, more than seven bits, and also about larger lookup tables and larger computers. And additionally, the filtering time will probably increase because we have to access the bit for every token in the read. If the read gets longer, we have to do many more memory accesses. Do you have any other ideas? Yeah? They're not just feasible, but could you move the computations to like 
SSD like that like uh, just there. So you could have false code. Yeah, that would be a yeah, to supplement the problem of memory. But then uh, the question is, is it still fast enough because uh, this group filter access us like for every token you need, it has to be probably control or what you have. Maybe this might be a problem, but try it yet. Anything else? Yeah. You think you're writing the over the things that are parallel across the screen? Where you like have split up everything, but then not just like doing everything separately, but then like try to merge it together again to not lose this information. Because so we split the reads and then later we get the information back somehow. Yeah. Or I don't know exactly how the reading this might be. Even if you have an idea how this works, then it's okay. Can you wait? I can't leave them. On top of my head, I don't see okay. how this might be possible. But Definitely ready to explore. Okay, then I will move on to the next problem. I already hinted a bit at it. We have this repetitive memory access. So if you have a read, you have to access the bits in here for each token in the read. This means we have to load the row buffer for each token in the read. Thus, the memory access is an over of the read length. And this might be significant, significantly more than, this, than the distinct token count. For especially in repetitive DNA, which is kind of common. For example, look at this read. It consists only of A's, and there are many AAA tokens in here. And for each of these tokens, we have to access this bit and add it to the sum. In this case, it might be not a problem because the row buffer is copied down and it stays there. But if we have a short repeating sequence here, we might have like five rows which get accessed, and they have to be accessed many, many times just to add one here. Do you see like a solution how we could improve this to avoid this repetitive accessing of this bit? So my idea here was to count the tokens first in a first step and then calculate the sum later so that we do not access for every token here, but we count them first here and then add the sum of the tokens here if there's a one. Yeah. But also simulate trees for like a token still be such that um we will go less than first. So you mean we could increase token size? Yeah. Yeah. That would reduce the number of access here, but also increase the bit tracker size extremely fast because it's like four to the power of n. So if you have the memory, you could do this, but probably you don't have to spare. My idea was, as I said, to count tokens first and calculate the sum later. Yeah. Or do you know some statistics about the power of the team? Oh, no. I'm sorry. I don't know statistics, but I know there's some sequences in DNA which are quite repetitive, but I don't know how many of them are, how this exactly looks like. This, well, all this discussion part here should be really good. In more detail, it's just some ideas I have, which might be completely wrong or right or wrong. Yeah, and this would solve the problem because it will only carry one memory access for each token appearing more than once. But the problem here is that we need more specialized hardware. Now we need to count the tokens first and then store this value for later use. This means we need to put the power of n um, registers large enough to hold the target count. And also we have to upgrade our incremental lookup tables to full address, which also require much more space. And interestingly here, this tokenization then could be parallelized with the summation. So we have, we tokenize like one of them, count the tokens, and simultaneously do a summation and threshold check for another one. Do you have any other ideas how we could tackle this problem, or do you see other problems and have ideas for them? Yeah, I, I don't have another idea, I'm just confused. Uh, oh, yeah, you, you say you counted tokens. Is yeah, it to itself counted tokens? 
Or yeah, it was like counting at different time. Ring filter counts them and has to, to for each of these tokens, he has to do memory access to determine if it has to add it or not. And I uh, propose to add these tokens first here. Yes. So like all of them are A's. So I know AAs come, uh, appears like 100 times. And then here, instead of reading this bit 100 times and adding 100 times, I read it once and add 100 at, at a time. So you reduce maybe the access to the bigger structure. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And okay. yeah, I, I think this could help because it could be that some reads have many more tokens if you all look at all of them instead if you just look at which one really appear in there they're on like five or, or, or a few which appear like in this case there are hundreds of tokens this way but all of them are in are there any questions about like design decisions should i talk about this bit or yeah in general, how does like I mean first the the DNA reads aren't always completely accurate, right? Yeah, it might be errors of the meaning or this not quite uh, exactly how they should be. The screen filter address is sort of this part of the pre-processing processing step. Um the pre-processing is done on the, the on like the, the filtering step. Because I mean is it possible that we might filter out parts that should keep because they might have never in them? So I probably should go back to the slides where I talk about the threshold value. This slide here. So this is uh, probably the answer to your question. Here we choose the threshold such that a read with too many errors. Wait, I have to think about how I formulate my sentence here. So here we have like the error tolerance. The specific alignment accepts some errors, and we try to choose the threshold such that we do not discard seat, the seat locations which will pass or which might pass. So we do not discard information too early. And this is done by this overestimation of the numbers of error CDVs just passing away. Right. So we know based on the machine's views how or approximate, approximate how many errors will there be, or is that just based on? Um, I, I think the error tolerance is like fixed in the remapper, and there are other error correcting steps before remapping, which might differ depending on the machine. But if the machine makes too many errors, it would be difficult for the remapping in general. So I think this is not just a printed problem, but a general problem. Yeah. 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 Any more questions or? Well, then I'm finished. I want to thank my mentors for their help and thank you for listening. Yeah, of the end of the long release with this sort of approach. I think I, I really like this paper in the sense that it introduces new data structures to represent the reference genome you know, in a very hard work friendly way. It's possible to uh, do the alignment filtering. It's really nice because I think we need to be reading the data structures to represent the reference genome. You know. But the downside is it doesn't work very well with long reads. It works reasonably well for short reads, but it needs to be evaluated better. So you at that point was really correct. And the other point that we made is there could be other optimization. Yes, there could be lots of other optimizations actually in this. It was more of a proof of concept. I think you can actually change that some of the thresholding functions, for example. Also, I don't like the thresholding functions paper that much. Uh, and also change 
do operating operations that you mentioned today. And maybe that's a more hardware yeah. to actually make this much more higher performance and more efficient. But there's more work to be done in this area. It's one of the sort of these papers that, that looks at how to accelerate genomics using processing in memory. With the hardware software co design approach. It just doesn't take one algorithm and see how we map it to the hardware. It really rethinks the data structures. My feel is understudied. So there it is. We want to actually do a lot more studies right here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to use it. Should I use this one? Right there. Uh, there are papers on using processing in memory to accelerate sequence alignments. I don't think that they did compare to your filter, but I don't think any of them really has all of mine. This sort of well, new data structure that we actually can find in a better way. But I like the direction of the new data structure. Some of them, some approach, for example, is hyperdimensional computing. They also look at new data sensing to very large vectors. That's a totally different approach. It's a, it's a more open area. So. There's your red one coming. Are there papers? There are papers about papers over here? Uh, no. Okay. 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 I, I will uh, introduce Nicola. Are we good in the room? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. All right, great. Yeah, hi everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our next presenter, uh, Nicola Lohr. He's a second year uh, computer science student at ETH. He's going to present Seagram, another very exciting genomics accelerator paper. Please, Nicola, take it away. Thank you for the introduction. I would like to welcome you all to CGRAM, a universal hardware accelerator for genomic sequence to graph and sequence to sequence mapping. And if the remote works, let me just continue. I should take it. Okay. Uh, we start with the executive summary. The motivation behind the paper is that there is currently a lack of accelerators for genomic sequence to graph mapping. And the problem here is that uh, the software solution are really slow. And that's why the goal was to build a software port where co-design algorithm for solving sequence to graph mapping. They introduce a universal hardware accelerator for sequence to graph mapping, uh, which includes MinSeed, the first minimizer-based seeding accelerator for genome graphs, and BitLine, the first bit vector-based sequence to graph alignment accelerator. And uh, they compared CGRAM to the current sequence uh, graph software and saw that it had a near, at least nearly a factor four speed up in mapping. Bit align alone outperforms even state of the art mapping tools in sequence to graph and sequence to sequence. And at the end, they conclude that. Uh, that CGRAM uh, has a higher throughput compared uh, to the current tools and low power consumptions and is the first universal genomic mapping accelerator framework for sequence to graph. I'm also doing a little background, although we heard most of it in the presentation before and on uh, a few weeks ago. In, I think our second seminar, but as we all have heard now multiple times, the genome is the blueprint of life. Uh, 
the variations in the genomes lead to variants in uh, plants, in animals, in human beings. And some of these variations are also how uh, diseases can be detected. And that's why it, looking at the genome is interesting uh, for medicines, but also for other aspects. Uh, as we've seen just uh, half an hour ago, that uh, the genome is a sequence of HCT, and we currently have a sequence. We have sequencing machines, but all of them only give us a partial sequence of the genome. That is the reason why we actually need the mapping tools. Uh, we get millions of partial measurements of the genome. We call them weeds. And if you remember, uh, stacking them gets as high as the front half. And the whole process of getting these reads, these partial sequences, is called the genome sequencing process. The problem here is that the African pan genome contains about 10% more DNA than the current human reference genome. This leads to reference bias. Uh, you can imagine that you have a human reference genome and a few reads. Uh, in this case, the reads perfectly match or nearly perfectly match our human reference genome. genome. So the mapping works fine. We have only small errors introduced by the sequencing machine, but otherwise we can just fit it together. In reality, we often have part of the genome which is different to the rep human reference genome. And although we like to fit it like here, that we know, yeah, that's the mouse, it, it's supposed to go here. But when you do the mapping process, it's actually, uh, it could be here, but it would probably match down here as well. And, uh, or down by the eyes, because of a lot of white. And so we don't have enough similarities and that introduces a lot of error in the mapping and uh, we can lose this data. Uh, one solution is to, we have the multiple reference genomes, so we can uh, compare every read to every signal uh, of our reference genomes. One may fit better to uh, uh, one of the reference genomes, one fits better to another. But that is a simple solution just to try them. A better solution is to merge all reference genomes into one big graph. This avoids redundant data and computation because uh, when you compare it to here, all this white space is for all of them the same thing. We only have to uh, store and compute it on the data which is different in the different reference genomes. And as an additional bonus, it also captures unknown combinations which between some reference genomes. Uh, to see how such a genome graph looks like, we go through an example, but first, uh, such a genome, uh, so, so a genome graph is actually just a combination of different reference genomes, such that one graph covers all references and combinations of it. For example, when we have the sequence here with a T in the middle, which is here missing, which us can split them apart and may uh, put in a node T and connect them. Alone, here alone, that doesn't help us anyhow, but as soon as we have a variant in there, instead of having a second sequence, we just have a second path how we get there. 
And even if you have an addition, an extra element in there, we just, like here, the two T's instead of one, we just can add the, uh, a path in our graph. Also works with node, uh, with our original sequence in here. The sequence to graph stages are very similar to the sequence to sequence pipeline stages. We again have here two pre-processing step two offline steps, which are done before the actual computation, which is the genome graph construction. This thing we saw on the slide before, where we take the different reference genomes and the variances and combine them into a genome graph. And then the indexing of this genome graph, genome graph into a hash table based index. And then uh, there's online part where we start with the hash table and the reads from the sequence genome and do the seeding on them. Then uh, we get the candidate where the where on the genome graph on the subgraphs we have to look for the reads to match. This goes through a filtering. Uh, we had a talk just before about filtering. And then at the end, there is the alignment process so that we get the optimal alignment between the read and the subgraph. The sequence to sequence alignment uh, is a, like a dynamic programming type, it's a matrix where you only have to look at the neighbors. It's similar to edit distance. But with the sequence to graph alignment, we have to also consider the so called POPs, the success, successors in the graph, which are also in a possible uh, way to get to this node. So it gets more complicated. But uh, knowing this, their goal was to design a high performance, scalable, powered area efficient hardware accelerators, which removes the bottleneck in both the seeding and the alignment steps of the sequence to graph mapping, but still support short and long reads. And they did that with introducing CGRAM. CGRAM provides efficient and general purpose acceleration for sequence to graph mapping. It is a co-design between an algorithm and hardware accelerator. It consists out of two parts. MinSeed, the first minimizer-based seeding accelerator for genome graphs, and BitAlign, the first bit vector-based sequence to graph align, alignment accelerator. For, that we can use CGRAM, we first have to do a little pre-processing. Like we already mentioned, we need to generate the genome graph using the linear reference genomes. In the paper, they use the VG toolkit to do that. This Now we have a graph which uses all variations as an alternative path in the graph. And we get one graph per chromosome that we can use this efficiently, we need to sort the graph topologically, which always works because there's, it's directed and there aren't any backwards loops in there, which should make sense. Uh, the hardware of the CGRAM is mainly the CGRAM accelerator, but it also needs a host CPU and main memory where the graph-based reference and index is stored in. Uh, in the CGRAM accelerator, we have MinSeed and BitAlign. MinSeed consists out of three scratch pads and three operation units. And BitAlign consists out of two scratch pads, uh, two operation units, and one queue. And the host, First submits the reads to the scratch pad, 
which then gets uh, to the minimizer to find the minimizers in the read, uh, which gets stored in the scratch pad and goes through the minimizer filter, which uh, it gets filtered by the frequency. This goes to the seed scratch pad and uh, afterwards it's looked for the alignment and the align, uh, not the alignment, the memory region. And the memory region with the scratch pad gets put into the input scratch pad. There we they generate the bit vectors, uh, which, they, which are needed. And uh, it needs the queue, the hops to do so. And these again get stored in the scratch pad. And afterwards, uh, they perform traced back, which gets sent back to the host machine. Looking a little bit closer at the min seed algorithm is that we saw that in the previous presentation, the k mares here, they, you split the sequence into little chunks. Here, the k is three. We have uh, overlapping chunks of three. Uh, and we, in a certain window, we store only the smallest k mare. Uh, in this example, we only store the, this one here. Uh, this decreases the storage requirements. And, but it has still the effect that we always get the same seeds out of the uh, same input sequence, which is important. Uh, and then knowing the minimizer and the seed, we calculate only with arithmetic operations, which part of the memory we have to load. We know the read query and uh, we know how big the query is and we know where we found our minimizer. And with that, we can uh, calculate the range for so the X and Y uh, to uh, load only the necessary part out and not only the necessary subgraph out of uh, memory, not always the whole graph. Here again, uh, the min seed algorithm. This time it is in a more pipeline stage, we, but here we see again, we look for the minimizer, filter them out by, uh, with two high frequencies and then look for the seed region. Uh, and this gets them passed to the bit alignment. Looking at the bit alignment algorithm, we've, I've shown you a little bit of that before. It is a dynamic programming table. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have to look at the successors, not only at the direct neighbors in the matrix, but uh, the Big issue here is that it could access any previous values. So uh, caching and these operations can be very wasteful. Uh, and we see that in the uh, hardware that the main difference to sequence to sequence alignment is these hop queue registers. These are this, their main purpose is to uh, keep the data from the hops back and make this more efficient. Uh, all in all, the CGRAM accelerator uh, doesn't need to communicate with anyone else but the host. And that's why we can easily stack multiple CGRAM accelerators to a CGRAM modules, uh, which then depends on the bandwidth of the memory, how many you can stack. But uh, the important thing is they don't communicate with each other. They're just uh, communicating with the host. CGRAM can be uh, employed as the whole end-to-end -end mapping for the all complete online uh, steps of the pipeline. It can do long and short reads, 
and sequence to graph, but also sequence to sequence mapping. Sequence to sequence mapping is a special case of sequence to graph because uh, it's just no successors, no X or L, everything just linear. That's why it always also works for sequence to sequence if it works for sequence to graph. <laughs> the bit align can also be just used as a standalone uh, sequence to graph aligner and can be coupled with any seeding accelerator. Similar, min seed can also be used as a standalone seeding accelerator and be coupled with any alignment tool or accelerator. They synthesized uh, CGRAM with a 28 nanometer process at one gigahertz. Uh, and for us important is we have, they compared afterwards to the results they got with the Intel Xeon uh, CPU. And we see that the difference in size and in power consumption is very much in favor of CGRAM. Additionally to that, uh, when we compare it to Graphline and VG, it also has a higher throughput. Here, it's a logarithmic scale of how many uh, reads, long reads per second can be performed on four different data sets. And on average, CGRAM is 5.9 or 3.9 times faster than Graphline and VG with long reads. With short reads, it's similar, but with a little bit higher uh, numbers. Uh, it's 106 or 742 times faster. Uh, same scale again, a different data set though, because of short reads, not long reads. When just looking at bit align uh, for sequence to sequence alignment, we saw earlier that we need an additional hot queue register. This is additional cost. But compared to uh, Genism, uh, there is no real sacrifice in performance. Then bit alignment is comparable with Genism and other uh, sequence to sequence alignment tools and outperforms them all uh, in these tests provided in the paper. When looking a little closer at MinSeed, we uh, want to realize that it's not on the critical path of the overall CGRAM. Uh, MinSeed uses the same optimization like the baseline software that it discards high frequency uh, seeds, seeds that come up so often that uh, trying to align every occasion of it just would be uh, a waste of time. And with some threshold, they just discard them. With that, they reduce the total amount of uh, seats uh, from 77 million to 35 million. Uh, but filtering could reduce that in similar approaches to even 48,000. Still, CGRAM is overall faster because of bit align. To my conclusion, uh, CGRAM is a promising framework for accelerating both graph-based and traditional linear sequence-based genome uh, sequence analysis. MinSeed is the uh, they introduced MinSeed, the first minimizer-based seeding accelerator for sequence to graph. And they also introduced bit align, uh, the first sequence to graph alignment accelerator. And they show with the results that uh, hardware algorithm co-design has potential when it, about accelerating graph based genome analysis. And they hope that it inspires 
uh, future research in this topic. Additionally, uh, CQM outperforms state of the art software and hardware solutions. Uh, yeah, uh, before I come to my uh, discussion or the strengths and weaknesses, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask again how uh, this almost came here to the actual like on the slide for you. Oh, that's lexicographically. Uh, that's. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's lexicography, so it's an A. Looking at here, it's we have two K mirrors with an A at the beginning and G, but C comes lexicography before T. It has, how I understood it, it ha just has to be uniform, it has to be the same everywhere, and it has to be distinctive so that you can decide. But, uh, and we are talking here about ledgers, so lexicography makes sense. You can apply numbers to it and frequency analysis and so and that could maybe have a benefit in some case, but they just use simple lexicography, the uh, smallest scheme. Does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They compare mean series to other filtering approaches. Uh, are, are we not really filtering, it's, it's really from the analysis side. How many single patients that you know this one? This one, yeah. Can they also be used for patients or mean seed and then another filter? Yes, mean seed is no filter. Uh, mean seed uh, uses just a uh, that, for example, uh, in your presentation, you had the A's. A lot of A's, and that when you realize, yeah, so seed comes up so often that trying to match it to everyone, it doesn't work, and then you just discard it, just remove it. It's not a real filter because it, when we look at the pipeline from Here at the pipeline, it's still in the seeding part. Oh, yeah. it, uh, it is before we even find the mapping locations. Uh, yeah, that's why filtering is a separate thing, which I come back to in the discussion. Yes? Um, is the graph that results from this equals to graph? Yeah. Uh, uh, always unique for certain or um, as it can, can there also be some some work of that that uh, like map to the same secret. The creation of the graph is not really mentioned, or it's mentioned that they used Vichy, the Vichy toolkit, but uh, I believe, or I assume that they uh, removed redundant paths, uh, but at the end, uh, yeah, it could happen, but I think uh, you have to remove them, otherwise we just have two parallel paths uh, for the seek, uh, for two genomes, uh, which, yeah, misses the purpose of having a graph in general. So uh, it was not discussed in the paper, but I don't think that there is much uh, redundant path, many redundant paths in the genome graph, which is created. Yeah? Uh, how long the uh, effort is, the throughput, or what? Like, uh, just 
uh, the bit line is the main point, and when we look here, it, and of, when you look here or also at the code, it looks like we have to iterate. We go through the table, and then we go through all the success nodes. If we can assume that the uh, success nodes here uh, are all under a certain constant, uh, we have, I think, uh, n times n at the end. So query read times uh, graph based reference of the length of the genome of the graph. Yeah, the yes, but uh, there is the constant factor when we have. We, I removed now the amount of successors. If that could be also a variable which can scale uh, as big as possible, or uh, then we have an additional S or however you want to call this, and we have N times M times S on, instead of N times N. So it's about the constants here, not the, per se about the complexity. Let me get back here. So uh, then I continue with the strengths of the paper. I really liked that they introduced an actual product, an actual pipelining system one can, uh, and not just a theoretical part of it, but actual uh, with results and actual purpose. Uh, I also really like that CGRAM even outperforms the sequence of sequence accelerators, although they are a lot more optimized than the sequence to grab software there currently is. And I really liked that, that all processes were very well explained and uh, reading the paper, everything was clear. For me, the weaknesses was uh, that there's a very minimal, minimalistic code on GitHub. For example, the hardware code is not available at all. And the code which is available only is available in uh, so like a proof of concept code without comments with uh, code commented out uh, and not in a uh, way I could actually read it and understand it without knowing already what it does. Uh, one major thing for me is that the, there was no filtering here. Uh, like the question from before, yeah, Mincy does a little bit of a threshold analysis, but no real filtering, although the paper says it's a stage. Uh, uh, it doesn't do that. Additionally, there were lack of figures for some numbers. A few more graphs for uh, certain numbers would, would have helped uh, because the, there were just the relative numbers in the text and having a graph there, which just says, yeah, we are at 10 by the power of three or at the 10 by the power of thousand uh, could have already helped with the actual throughput numbers, not just the relative numbers to other results. And a similar point is that I think uh, they did a lot of comparisons with uh, software and hardware solutions, but they rush over a few of the results, which I would have liked to know more about and uh, maybe even know a little bit the background why they assume this change and result. As I have mentioned, there's no filtering in Seagram. Uh, and we've learned in the second week, if I'm not mistaken, about Sneaky Snake. Uh, why didn't they just use sneaky snake filter? 
if that helps to remind you what sneaky snake is. It's not compatible because this here needs a sequence and as soon as there are alternative paths, uh, it gets a lot more complicated and it doesn't work as beautifully as uh, with just sequence to sequence mapping. So they, why didn't they use any other filtering? We've heard uh, one just the previous talk about one filter. Yeah. Yeah, in the pres your presentation, that could be the case that uh, it has to be transferred to a different place. It is in hardware, so uh, this can be figured out because they actually did custom hardware for the main seat and for the bit align. And then the, having a middle piece with a filter in there uh, could have, or in my opinion, wouldn't have been extremely much more work. So they could have matched the input and output of with the filter. What I've seen is there is currently no sequence to graph filter. Uh, and and uh, it's also tricky to implement this in, especially when we look at CGRAM, because uh, it needs to hold up with bit lines. So we need another algorithm hardware co design. Then, if the filter becomes our bottleneck, and this could get to the degree that it's worse than just not having a filter at all. But I believe that because to a filter, we can reduce from a few millions to a few thousands, uh, it could have a huge potential of speeding the alignment and up or the whole uh, sequence to graph mapping process. The other question is that, does it make sense to uh, do some inexact swing matching. We heard from before there's some tolerance, but uh, the sequence, the genome sequence machines make mistakes. Uh, they give partially false data. And would it make sense to uh, have an inexact swing matching algorithm instead of a complete mapping algorithm? There are some advantages. There is a research group uh, which designed ISMATCH, which uh, they created their own inexact string matching algorithm for hardware. They also co designed uh, uh, the algorithm with hardware, and it increased the performance up to 70 times compared to the software. But it doesn't have support for sequence to graph. So that is just sequence to sequence. But I believe with uh, it could also potentially have advantages for sequence to graph uh, to filter out or get rid of the errors created by the machines. Are there any questions to the whole presentation or the discussion yeah. Um, in the presentation at the beginning, and the background part, you said that there are um, many different records, um, like the first genome. Yes. Um, yeah, genomes. Do you know, like, is it region based? Because you said, for example, that um, the average and the genome um, can present more data than the records on the that's used as standard. There are re region based ones. Uh, there are, uh, that's I think also the basis from where you can do the 24MB or something like this tests, uh, where they tell you, yeah, you come from 
this part of the world or that part of the world. So to a certain degree, yes, a region based, but I think there also have other variances in there. And today with globalization, it's where you come from, not where you currently are. Uh, and yes, so I think there are many and a good part of them, I believe are region based, but I think there are also some other variances. I, I don't know, but I could imagine that there are some illnesses or so which have their own uh, variants, own reference genome where you can match against to figure these things out. But uh, there's the Human Genome Project or something like that, which uh, has a lot of these genomes open source, where you can just look through them and or find some tags which fit. And there you would find out what kind of reference Any other questions? If not, thank you all for listening to my presentation. Thanks for my mentors helping me. Uh, and with that, I conclude my presentation. Thank you. I like your pictures that show the different variations that lead to a graph-based genome representation. And this is a new frontier that we've discussed by my own data filtering. You have software I can not filter. That's designed for this purpose. Yeah, it's so, really new. Yeah, a lot of things need to be adapted to really match the sequence of graph mapping. There's a lot more to do in this area for sure. I think you have discovered some example areas that yeah. can be accelerated and also worked on. You know the software side, there isn't a lot of work in some of these areas. Yeah, it's uh, also a sequence to sequence, you find a lot of results to what sequence to graph. Yeah, it's one of the few papers I found. Yeah, to that. But, yeah but it's, uh, there's a lot of evidence that representing these variations encoded into a single, let's say, graph-based genome is better for end-to-end -end analyses. Right? Yeah, I think with science. the reference bias and everything, it's obvious that there is huge potential in doing it with sequence to graph and instead of sequence to sequence. Yeah, but we do need to move to more uh, sequence to graph-based methods overall. This is a very right area for research if anyone's interested. Yeah, just a reminder for the evaluation forms that they are already available and the quiz. Early. Well, I'm